Welcome to the Women in Fishing podcast. I'm Chris Woodward. The Women in Fishing podcast is sponsored by Axo Noble Yacht Coatings, makers of Interlux and All Grip products for boats. Now, normally I design these podcasts to instruct and encourage women anglers using a panel of guests, but today I want to do something a little bit different. I want to spotlight one woman angler who has extensive worldwide fishing experience, as well as knowledge and concern for fisheries in the marine environment. My guest today is Jessica Harvey. Jessica is a zoologist and CEO of the Guy Harvey Foundation. She was raised in the Caribbean and nurtured toward a career as an environmental conservationist by her parents which include dad, Dr. Guy Harvey, the well-known marine artist and fisheries biologist. Her passion lies in education and she partners with non-governmental organizations, government agencies, corporations, and private citizens to plan creative ways to show the importance of a balanced, healthy ecosystem. Welcome to the podcast, Jessica. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. It's such a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's great to meet you. And I love the picture behind you. That's a beautiful fish Thanks. right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's one of my favorites. Um, uh, I figured it was very appropriate given the topics of discussion today. It's a blue marlin that's been tagged by a satellite tag. Um, and we got it as a film when we were re- in Panama not too long ago. Oh, so okay. One of my favorites. Mm-hmm. A fairly recent photograph then, huh? Yes. It was lucky okay. the conditions were just right. <laughs> uh, it is gorgeous. Have, yeah, Panama is on the Pacific side being such nutrient-rich waters. You often battle with the cameras in green water or water filled with plankton and all sorts of other things. So having a clear blue shot is just sometimes gold. And I was yeah. lucky to be in the right place at the right time to get it. Yeah, that's amazing. Yes, I know. I mean, that's they have wonderful upwellings of nutrients over there on the Pacific side. And, mm-hmm. and definitely that can make the underwater photography a little more difficult. Mm-hmm. So anyway, you know, let's continue talking a little bit about uh, your fishing. Obviously, uh, you have fished for billfish, but feel, you know, just tell us about maybe your first fish or your favorite species or where you love to fish the most. Any special memories you've got? Oh, man. I don't, I didn't know where to begin. (laughs) So (laughs) there's so many great memories. I, I'm so lucky to have been Mm -hmm. with a family that really pushed being outside. And especially, as you mentioned, my father being such an avid fisherman himself, we were always from a young age out on the boat and, you know, seeing what was out there and fishing. So earliest memories would have been in Jamaica, but one of my favorite earliest ones was um, being in Panama. We'd often go there because he found a lot of inspiration just off of Tropic Star because the concentration of water, having an oxygen minimum zone at such a shallow depth meant that a lot of fish are pushed up in the upper um, surfaces of the water, upper column, water column. And so you're able to see such a variety of animals and have a lot more frequent interactions with them than some of the other places around the world. And so when I was five, we were brought out on the water and (laughs) we caught a big 400 pound blue marlin. I remember it being, it was really hot and I was really like trying to see this fish and but not being able to concentrate at the same time because I just kept wanting to look up and I could hear my father going wine 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 (laughs) 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 that seems to be like the mantra of of any angler's day but it was really cool I was couldn't have done obviously done it on my own so Stuart Campbell was assisting me at the time and he's since passed but he was an incredible angler himself and it was such a privilege to have spent that time with him and dad but certainly in terms of places and, and species to fish, I've been so lucky. It was It's so hard to pick just one. But what really spurred on the adventure of it all was the fact that dad was very keen to try for IGFA world records. And so we would go to Panama every year. Um, we'd sometimes go to Alaska and completely different fishing techniques for different species but just equally exciting. So those to me were compelling memories from a very young age in the fishing world. So did you, you had a lot of uh, junior or small fry records when you were growing up? 
I had a few. <laughs> um, I, it's uh, a lot of them have since since um, been broken, which you know is wonderful to see. It was funny though, like what I didn't appreciate, and I only learned very recently because Dad is writing a book himself um, that will be coming out soon about um, his early fishing memories. We would train for a week in advance before we would go on these expeditions and he would sit us with a bucket in the backyard and we would, and a fighting chair on top. And we would go through the motions of catching a fish because with an IGFA record, you had to do it on your own. You couldn't rely on anybody handing you the rod. Like you did everything. And he would pretend he'd put something like a stick or a nail or something in between the leader and um, run down the yard, and it was, <laughs> you know, like literally creating the motions of it. And the dogs would follow him down the yard, and then he'd say, "Okay, now you know, put the drag up, you know." And he'd show us how to count and wait to do that, and then we'd wind in, practice the techniques. You needed that before you went, and it made it more fun because you felt like you had a a role um, yeah. in the whole thing. But yeah, so it was it was really fun. I mean, the records were a bonus, but yeah. just being out there was enough really for me. I really enjoyed it. Was that like for holidays after school? Did you go to regular school or were you were yes. you homeschooled and got to go on these expeditions during the school year? Uh, well, sometimes we were pulled out of school, <laughs> not not to the pleasure of our teachers per se, but uh, sometimes it was most of the times it was during breaks before we started school again in January. Um, and then a couple of times during the summer, it was lucky. I think it probably would have been easier if I was homeschooled sometimes, yeah. <laughs> but, um, it was an education. And sometimes, you know, what was nice is that the teachers actually embraced the fact that I was going somewhere and sometimes would ask me to showcase what we, where I went and what we did. Um, so that was pretty cool to, bring back the adventure and share what I learned. And it cemented a lot of the natural history of uh, the geography and things that I wouldn't have really necessarily covered in school at the time. Well, it's nice that they were able to kind of give you credit for that. And mm -hmm. I would say too, that when you would go uh, on these adventures with your father, it was about probably also about learning about the ocean too, and about the species and checking the stomach contents and yes, you know, yes. Those kinds of things. I have to say, because I'm married to a, bio, a marine biologist. So I kind of have, I kind of have that ongoing situation happening myself on a regular oh, basis. That's so, awesome. Isn't yeah. it? But doesn't that kind of knowledge help paint the picture of what you're doing that much more it's like you you better understand the the whole experience with that background so that's really cool that you have that as well that's yeah awesome I assume too that you learned to scuba dive and snorkel and all of that pretty early as well as the fishing yes the earliest you could learn to dive was 10 we moved from Jamaica to the Cayman Islands in 99 and when we moved we were able to learn how to dive and it was exciting because it was clear waters the current wasn't so bad so you felt pretty safe and there were so many places to go visit and the reefs were in a significantly better state than they were in Jamaica I didn't fully appreciate at the time what that would allow me to do down the road as it you know in the way that I use it now as a environmental conservationist but it really made me appreciate dad's art that much more because I realized how authentic it was because I was now seeing it for myself. Whereas before, you know, he would go off on these massive adventures and come back and we would be sitting in the studio and he would be sketching or painting or sometimes even allowing us to help little bits of his paintings and talking about the behaviors that he witnessed, color changes, you know, why he saw it when he did, whether it was something to do with the with the full moon or no moon or, you know, if people listening haven't been to the Cayman Islands are interested, definitely a place to check out for sure. And what dad loved about it was that about a mile and a bit from shore, you could go blue marlin fishing. So it was <laughs> very, um, very advantageous to be here. So you could go diving and then go fishing in between and on your surface intervals. So what better way to spend a day, right? <laughs> really? Best of both worlds. That's awesome. Obviously, listening to your father talking about these things while he was painting and sketching and so on, 
you know, had to, I'm sure, stir some interest. But was there a point in time when you or have you always thought, I want to do I want to be, you know, a conservationist. I want to be a zoologist or a scientist or when did that happen for you? The responsibility of being a conservationist, it was taught to us at an early age, but you didn't buy through more action than words. Um, so, you know, we saw when dad would chuck back a fish that he considered too small or would say, you know, this could grow more. They grow much bigger. We used to go out every weekend when we were kids and we were, he was always conscientious of trash. Like that is his absolute pet peeve is walking, um, somewhere and seeing trash on the ground and he's constantly picking it up. We knew that, you know, we had a responsibility to do our part in making sure we looked after our environment, but we didn't fully appreciate or be able to articulate articulate that until much later because it was just a done thing. Um, But as we learned more and because dad is a scientist and he would go to conferences and then he did his shows and he's always talking about the importance of preserving our oceans and his, you know, line that he would drive home all the time is it is our collective responsibility to conserve the marine environment and maintain the biodiversity of his planet. The privilege of being able to travel to places like um, Panama, like Guatemala, um, Australia, Costa Rica, parts of Europe, it's just parts of the States, you really get a sense of, wow, there's a lot of people who may not have had the education that I've had or the experiences I've had. um, And they have their own traditions and ways that they've been doing things for so long and which may be helping the situation or not helping the situation. And in my role now, um, in terms of an environmental advocate, it's really been helpful to better understand particularly when it comes to fishing right because fishing to some can be considered controversial um but it has come such a long way in its history from when we used to kill everything particularly right. bellfish and now um with science and education um and pushes for policy changes um you now have the billfish conservation act in place which prevents the exportation of billfish to the states and then you have the shark fin ban and then the you know over exploitation of mako sharks due to research i mean there's just been so many things that as we've learned over time how you know over harvesting is such a problem but there's a more sustainable way to do it like recreational fishing Mm -hmm. Um, and even then that has, you know, extremes are never good, but certainly having a catch and release policy has been extremely beneficial for our environment and allows us to enjoy this very sport that we love without having to deplete the environment and for the ecosystem services that they provide. So you kind of gathered all of that over the years. And then I guess when you graduated high school, you just said, okay, I'm going to this university and I'm going to study science or. (laughs) Yeah. Well, um, it was just a done deal. Yeah. All of, all of, well, all of that was, I mean, the science that I mentioned earlier had come out recently, but I actually wanted to be a vet for a long time. Uh Um, I was very interested in equine veterinary science because my grandfather bred racehorses in Jamaica. And at five years old, I was like, proud of the fact that I was not going to have grandpa pay for vet pills because I was going to be his veterinarian. <laughs> um, and then I chickened out of it come my 11th year in high school because I caved into the peer pressure of it being too competitive and went into zoology instead with the idea of, with the intention of sticking to terrestrial biology, mm. because I felt like dad's main part of that was marine science and I didn't want to necessarily follow in his footsteps the same way because I didn't want to develop in his shadow or with the expectation you know I wanted to earn the respect on my own so I went to University of Edinburgh and did zoology if I wanted to pursue veterinary science I could because you needed a zoology degree in some universities in order to do that or expand any kind of component and eventually found my way back to Cayman to be a research officer in the with the Cayman Islands government for three and a half mm. years. 
then moved on to work for the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation then as we've just recently changed to the Guy Harvey Foundation. So it's been a wonderful journey. Interesting. Well, I uh, you mentioned Edinburgh. And so I'm I'm having to think that, uh, of course, you must have read all, all of the All Creatures Great and Small series. Yes. Yes, I did. <laughs> They're fantastic. And um, have you that, Well, the- that was a big inspiration. I mean, he was one of the biggest inspirations for veterinary science in the time. Oh, um, absolutely. And you can see why. You know? Yeah. 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 And that new TV series is just awesome. That PBS series. But anyway, um, but that's very cool. So it's, you know, and I t- totally, uh, uh, you know, understand, you know, trying to make your own mark and, you know, the interest in terrestrial animals, you know, all animals, it's all connected, you know, have wanting to, yeah, to, to exactly. conserve the animals because they obviously they don't speak for themselves. So You've seen a lot, obviously, since you grew up. And I'm I'm also going to back up just a step and say that sure. a lot of times when we've been talking, you've said we and you have a brother. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, okay. I do. He's okay. two years younger than me. Um, and he but he's now got two beautiful daughters um, and so finds it more difficult to come out on these <laughs> expeditions with us. So but he's been he's always been there and we have a very close relationship. Um, so it's been, yeah, a, a really fun childhood with him. For Sweet. Sure. So you've seen a lot over the years in Jamaica and also in, in the Caymans with regard to the health of the ecosystem and the health of the fisheries. Can you kind of tell me what that progression has been like or can you characterize what you've seen over the years? We are facing an issue of shifting baseline syndrome, which is where we come in to a time where we think this, what we're seeing is the norm. And we depend on the previous generation to remind us that no, actually it's degraded a significant amount since. And if you saw it in our time, it was way more biodiverse and fish abundance was huge. And, and I mean, especially through my dad, you know, on his many travels to, to see it and, and learn the differences in that time is something that's very apparent now. And that's why we encourage people to not give up in terms of supporting conservation efforts in the various ways in which people do, because we need to get it back to a, a healthier and balanced ecosystem because our our next generation is going to depend on it. And it's going to be such a harder lift for them if we don't do something about it now. And there are success stories, which is encouraging. For example, in the Cayman Islands, you have um, a huge effort to protect Nassau groupers. And in, in the early 2000s, unfortunately, a lot of them were caught at the spawning aggregation site, which they come to once a year. And a lot of the fish, when they went to sell it to market, was spoiled. And a, and a lot of these animals were, were breeding females, large breeding females. It was a disaster because you're, you're reducing a very significant stock. And we've since seen science show that these animals are actually, the population of these animals are dependent locally. So they're not, we're not getting new recruitment necessarily from other Caribbean islands. So even worse that we'd had so many removed in one go. But thankfully, because the government here has been so proactive and then they've um, worked with um, other researchers uh, to be able to um, support the ban of fishing them for eight years. And it has allowed the population to come back. And now there's slot sizes and protected times. And it's amazing to see. And it's it's a great example that if we give nature a chance, it can bounce back. As a whole, overfishing is the biggest problem. And the population that depend on fish as a food source is a problem. And trying to balance that need with the way in which animals reproduce at a rate that they do, depending on what whether they're a shark or a billfish, is tough. And so the hope is that through education and research, we can explain this to people that there are reasons that regulations are in place. There are reasons that we need to limit the catch 
um, and, you know, support catch and release because otherwise um, we're going to lose this resource. And when you think not only just from a food resource perspective, but how much money economies receive through sports fishing and recreational fishing is massive. And um, so it has such a, a strong economic importance that we need to preserve. And then on top of that, you have climate change and you have pollution and you have um, all sorts of things affecting it. And sometimes it's so doom and gloom, but you have to think positively and think every little bit. If we all make an effort to to make a difference, it works. And I think COVID, as horrible as it was, was a fantastic juke of positivity from a nature perspective because we were able to see so much good change come from just a, a brief pause um in activity but well and you've seen you know kind of an you have more of an international perspective than say some of us who live in the states where you know we're focused more on what our federal government's doing in federal waters mm-hmm. and our state government's doing in state waters but we forget A lot of times that, especially with migratory species, we're talking about how these species are are treated in the Caribbean or and in the Pacific Mm -hmm. or, you know, in other parts of the world where, you know, they eventually get to our shores. I'm with the case of, you know, mahi or dolphin, you know, Mm -hmm. that that's a widely ranging fish that goes many, many places. And, you know, they Mm -hmm. don't know anything about state lines or country lines. And so you might feel like you're doing a great job, you know, in a certain zone and then you go, well, you know, but then they get killed down there and, you know, exactly. Yeah. exactly. So it's, it's you all know. interrelated, but you're right too, that, you know, we can, we can all do what we can do, you know, and, and everybody having a little bit of input, mm-hmm. you know, we'll, we'll push the ball down the field. So, you know, Absolutely. I mean, it is, it is sometimes hard to, you know, to get above that or beyond that sort of negative feeling about, oh, well, it's all going to heck in a handbasket and, you know, there's nothing we can do or whatever. But quite honestly, and one of the one of the messages that I feel is is very important as somebody who's been involved in conservation and fishing for a long time is that really individual fishermen can do quite a lot because if you educate yourself Mm -hmm. about the the proper release techniques you educate yourself about which species you can catch um how big they need to be there's not a lot of police out there we have we have to do Mm -hmm. it ourselves we have to be the ones that i mean we're the ones that the fish depend upon to do the right thing especially an important message for for me is, you know, educate yourself, do what you can do. What kind of, what are some of the bigger projects right now that the foundation has gotten involved in recently? Um, The picture behind me is an example of the satellite tagging that we've been supporting with Nova Southeastern University and Tropic Star Lodge for the last five years, where um, Ryan Logan, now Dr. Ryan Logan, who just defended his thesis last week and um, presented an amazing research on looking at the migration patterns between Pacific Blue Marlin, Black Marlin and sailfish, um, looking at the recovery times after, you know, these fish have gone through, you know, a, an exciting fight. Also comparing how they use the, the water column differently when they're concentrated to the top surface layers of the of the ocean off of Panama. It's been fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And he got a capture, like a camera capture of a sailfish going after uh, a bait fish. So the fit the camera is is you're looking at it from the right hand side and you can see the bill on the bit of the eye and you can see it coming from the bottom up toward the surface to to capture this fish. And because it had a satellite tag on it, he was able to recreate that entire dive in a 3D wow. model. Wow. Um, as well, I mean, it was just, it, it, if there's anybody to meet, it's Ryan. <laughs> he, is, <laughs> he is amazing. Um, and he, he built it because himself. So 
he would he would leave it on it's like an accelerometer that he would leave on with a float for three days and then he would have to go and pick it up and it's very hard to find um but he did he found all 19 of them um but he was also doing research on what these animals were eating and trying to find out more about that and collaborating with other people to see kind of how does this compare with other ranges where these animals are found. So that's been very exciting. And we're looking forward to continuing the next chapter of that with NSU and Tropic Star, which we're in the phase of organizing now. Can people see any of that information, some of the results yet on the website on the Guy Harvey Foundation? He's published um, a couple of chapters from his PhD already. So that is available to see. And then the Sun Centennial Act actually did an article on it in Florida, which was really, really cool. Yeah, it's there's definitely pieces of it that are available and he'll continue once the rest of it is published. So it will be available to the public. But yeah, we've been doing that and we've been supporting shark research in the Galapagos and uh, Mexico. We previously worked on rooster fish. I mean, you were asking earlier what some of my favorite fish to catch was. If it's not billfish, it's definitely rooster fish. Um, um, have you ever know? caught a rooster fish? Yes. Oh, are they the best? I just, oh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. I remember going for the first time and in, in, with Ryan actually in May, not the first time for me, but the first time for him, it was so exciting. I mean, yeah. when you're using um, the poppers and, and yes. you're really working hard for it, it just the gratification of the seeing the whole thing happen with the comb coming out of the water and then you're like, yes, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, I tell you, I mean, and it's the fight is hard too. Um, yeah. you know, and you know, some of the ones that you can catch are pretty big. That was fun to be able to do some satellite tagging yeah. on those animals. Um, oh, neat. You tag yeah. those too. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, and then as you mentioned, the dolphin fish tagging, we um support the dolphin fish research program, which has been exciting. A lot of my job really now is more than fishing is filming. I love seeing people other people catch fish. But when it comes to research, what's fun about the whole thing is that it's a team effort. You need mm -hmm. to work with a skilled captain and the skilled mates and an angler and the tagger. And there's no one dominating thing at all. It's just everything. All the pieces have to work together yeah. to be able to make sure that the fish that you're catching is looked after well and is not out of the water unnecessarily long and released right. quickly. It's very gratifying to be a part of that. Yeah. And I've seen him put on satellite tags for dolphin fish and has he's gotten some really interesting information and also supported his spaghetti tags as well, which have right. been really interesting. Um, one of the fish that we tagged in Cayman actually ended up in the Keys. And uh -huh. so that was really, um, you know, connecting the dots in terms of their pathway, migratory pathways. Um, Absolutely. There's a lot. I mean, and that's just on, um, sure. you know, there's so many more aspects that we support. Um, yeah. But what's exciting for me, the most exciting thing for me is to try to get and take that information that we're getting from research and putting it in educational formats that mm -hmm. are digestible and understandable to the public and particularly that can be put into school curriculums. Because okay. one of the things that we found and certain and you know, certainly for, for both of us, I think we probably grew up with the textbook way of learning. Mm -hmm. And some of these textbooks were outdated by the time it came across our places, you know, and, and a lot of them didn't have local examples. So to now have technology in our favor and video and photography that much better and that much more exciting, we can really showcase some of these things which are hard to you know not many people are going to see you're not going to see a blue marlin in a tank the only way you're going to see them is by making the time and effort um to go out there to where they are right and it's a it's a privilege to be able to be a part of the group that can bring this back to schools so that they when they do go out on the ocean they have a better appreciation of what they're seeing and why they need to be conserved. Yeah, it definitely needs to start with that generation for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, are there ways that our listeners who um, 
maybe don't have uh, school age children <laughs> or, yeah. uh, you know, have 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 gotten to the point where they want to give back or want to be involved. Are there ways that they can get involved in in conservation with the foundation or uh, oh, what yeah. would you recommend? Absolutely. We have a lot of resources available on our website. So by all means, um, please check them out. Um, there's a lot of videos and a lot of educational resources that um, are geared at different levels, but are, are good information to have. Um, some fun videos as well, too, with bite-sized chunks of information, which makes it more digestible. <laughs> I seem to be on a food trend in my comments today. <laughs> I wonder if it's because I'm, I don't know. I'm are you hungry? Eating, so I, I know. I, th- I was thinking, am I hungry? But I just eaten, so I shouldn't <laughs> be. I guess just talking about mahi and stuff has gotten me um, hungry. <laughs> right. Um but yeah, so we've just we've just had a um, launched an annual giving campaign on our website, so you can become a member and support the education and research efforts that we're we're supporting and um, executing, and and you know every little bit helps. Um, so there's components of it where you know you're able to get different things, some merchandise as a thank you. Um, through that membership program, you can join us on expeditions. So we'll be launching four expeditions this year. Three of them are ro- revolved around fishing. Well, two of my favorite places to fish are Panama and Guatemala. I was in Guatemala for the first time last year again. Like I went when I was a young girl, but as an adult for the first time. And it was amazing. Um, both Casa Vieja and Pacific Fins were awesome. And it's not if you catch a sailfish, it's how many yes. <laughs> you can catch it a day. And the skill set required to catch more than like we had quadruple headers of sailfish several times. Have wow. you been? Yeah. Oh, man. I actually I caught my first blue marlin in Guatemala, which is an odd place to catch your first blue marlin. Oh, but wow. yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. That would be the place to go for a grand slam then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and we definitely together. caught sailfish that day too. So oh, we had at least awesome. two billfish, but that was, that was it. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful place. Yeah. So I really, you know, I, I, it's an, the expeditions we run are educational as well as fun. I'll be on the boat and people can come fish with me and a visiting scientist to, who's going to share more about the local information. And then the, Private the proceeds will benefit the foundation. So that's a great way, particularly for anglers, if they want to come and see and learn and participate yeah. in the dolphin fish tagging as well, you know, following our social media and going online if there's something that you would like to volunteer for to let us know. But just broadly as well, finding something that you're passionate about, even if it's not with the foundation, of course, we're grateful if it is. But if you're an angler who is passionate about freshwater fishing and there's, you know, uh, topics and things that you feel like you would like to help in that way, you know, research more and go for it. Um, You know, if it's something relating to um, habitat restoration, you know, that's a big thing in terms of supporting the fishing industry that's so needed in so many places. You know, that's how we what role we play in that, depending on where you are. You know, do do make an effort to go and learn more about it, because as as you rightly said, Chris, you know, anglers are the best advocates because they're the ones on the water most of the time, particularly captains and mates. You have a a great ambassador role to play. And a lot of people are going to be looking to you for guidance with some of these restoration activities. Yeah. Um, and particularly from a research perspective, too, we depend on captains and mates to help us give the knowledge to say where are these animals going to be when. Right. Um, so it's so much of a team effort. And I thank you know you and the listeners for all you guys have done to yeah. inspire everybody and give a little bit of knowledge so that they you can. Yep, we can all play a part. So, mm-hmm. well, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about that we haven't really touched on? Just in terms of looking back on um, some of your questions, you you were asking, you know, any special memories, I think, with particularly with dad, I would not be here without his support. And I know that not everyone is lucky enough to have that level of support. We hope that we inspire you as and as and I say you as in listeners, that you can get out there and explore. I've had some epic 
fishing, um, fishing experiences, like in, in Mexico, having caught, having caught my first and only swordfish, um, which was a mammoth. Um, and I don't, you know, after that, I was like, that's my retirement piece. <laughs> you know, I just, <laughs> I, I don't need to, ca- I mean, it was, it was nearly three hours. I was not supposed to be on the rod and there were seven of us, two girls and the rest guys. And the person who was supposed to be on the fish was too hungover from the night before. So he was not in a, in a place to go and, and be on the rod. And then no one else like jumped up at the thing. So dad just put me on the rod and I was like, dad, you know, really like we can, we can give other people a chance. Anyway. So this thing comes up, this, she is 600 pounds of wow. just on the, I mean, the colors alone was insane. Wow. And I thought I have not trained for this. I am, you know, I came here to just <laughs> swim with whale sharks. Like what are they doing? <laughs> three hours yeah. later, you're crippled yeah. and yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but what was I, the last thing in terms of that is, um, you know, the, the swordfish is a, an example of a story that has done well, thanks to conservation efforts. And, you know, normally we wouldn't take an animal like that. I mean, by the time it was, it was so exhausted, um, after like a nearly three hour long fight, but we brought it back. Um, and it was thanks to Cap- Captain Anthony Mandillo and his team who are an amazing team and everyone got a piece. There was not anything wasted um from the fish and it was really a special day because dad dad particularly was proud of that being the angler that he was and then I remember catching my first black marlin which is around the same size dad is the type of person who can stare at lures all day long (laughs) there is nothing nothing that it can waver his patience in that way um, and I wish I was like that. I'm not quite as good as that, but he, he will do that. And he will tell you where this fish came, uh, write it down. You know, more recently I've, I've done a few expeditions without him, which is weird for me to do, but there was a Marlin where I, I saw it come up on the line and I can see it like as if it's in front of me now. And I was waiting for it and it came and hit the left short and I picked up the rod instinctively fed it, cooked it, released it. And I was like, that was just, I just like felt the knowledge from my dad come through me and go out with the best execution. And I thought that was, that is my favorite day. That was my favorite day. It just cherished the moment and all those years put together to have made that happen. It's amazing to do something completely on your own like that. And something that takes a lot of technique and a lot of uh, knowledge uh, and patience and calm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that's that's that is quite an accomplishment. So yeah, definitely congratulations on that. I Thank I you. I had a similar situation when I was uh, sail fishing actually by myself a um, number of years ago in, in West Palm Beach area mm. and caught, I caught a sailfish by myself. Um, that's awesome. Build it, released it. And that's my favorite catch of all time. So I totally get that. And uh, it sounds like we are kindred spirits and, yes, uh, and maybe <laughs> sisters in another world or sisters from another mother or something like that. But mm. uh Anyway, so yeah, I mean, I get that. And I, and I hope everybody out there gets a chance to have that experience too, because it it truly is awesome when all the pieces come together and everything works and that fish swims off and you're like, yeah. (laughs) Right. Cheers Cheers to that moment. Congrats on that too. It really is special. Sweet. All right. Well then I hope that everybody uh, that's listening will check out the website, get involved. And and as you said, even if it's not with the foundation, get involved locally. Um, A lot of state agencies do ask uh, anglers to tag fish, for instance, do spaghetti Mm -hmm. tagging of fish. Um, So there are citizen science projects out there that uh, that you can get involved in. So um, check your state fisheries websites and 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 see what you can do and, and get involved. And the only piece of advice I'd add to that too, if you do participate in citizen science programs like that, 
be really careful as to what data you're required because a you know good handwriting is important because if you've written down something that is very hard to read then it it's very difficult to add it to the database so if you've taken if you think about all the time and effort you've put in to tag an animal and then it re recaptured and you're like oh no but i can't read what it's saying i don't know where i don't know where it was released it, you know the data that point then it gets lost and it's you know it's it's unfortunate so definitely pay attention to how you're writing down data if you're asked to submit it and try and complete the whole data set because there's a reason that scientists are asking for this information and they try to make it as simple as possible but the required data in order to make the analysis strong because otherwise it makes it really difficult for them to use that data and yeah. they are so grateful to the time and effort but you know we've had several people who have had amazing recaptures and all they've put down is the name of the boat oh, <laughs> like, oh no 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 so please don't be that person um, you know, take the time if you need help help but that would be that you know cuz then when can you imagine if you get called and say your fish ended up I don't know, on the other side of the world and you were a part of that. And it's just, it's really cool to be a part of it. So yeah. Um, yeah. just a word of, of advice to all of you who are participating. We all greatly appreciate it. Good thought. Good thought. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right. Well, I think we probably hit our time limit too. Um, mm -hmm. So we, yes. we appreciate Way over time. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but hey, it has been fascinating, I think. Anyway, um, thanks for joining me, Jessica. I, I sure hope I get a chance to meet you on the water someday. Yes, I hope so too. And, and good luck with the rest of your podcast. And thank you for the honor of having me be on. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks much. Tight lines. <laughs>